Look at these poor fuckers. I don't even know what's about to hit them. The hammer of God.
mind introducing yourself on the mic? Sure. Uh, my name is Kevin Huffnagel. I play guitar in the bands Dysrhythmia, Gorguts, and Vora. And we're in Astoria, Queens right now, and I ran into Kevin uh, at a Napalm Death show, which is a good place to make friends. Yeah. Um, it was at that weird uh, Red Bull event where Napalm Death and Wolf Eyes and a bunch of weird noise bands played. Yeah. We were, we were both taking the shuttle, the shuttle back from uh, the, the event, like a, like a gotcha journalist, and uh, asked you if you were interested in doing the podcast, and you are very kind enough to make time for me, and I appreciate sure. it. Yeah, Thank no you. problem. Let's, let's start with your musical background. Uh, you're considered uh, an extremely proficient and technical guitarist, and I'm, I'm curious how you got started. Like, what made you want to play guitar? What got you interested in music? I grew up in, in somewhat, you know, somewhat of a musical household. Uh, mainly, mainly my mother. Uh, she she uh, played guitar and loved music, and I always um, played classical music a lot around the house. But um, also stuff. I, I mean, one of, one of the things I remember making the biggest first impression on me. It's probably Michael Jackson Thriller, you know, in particular the song Beat It, because that was the first time I ever heard a like guitar played like that. Cause I think I heard Beat It before I really heard Van Halen, because I was, you know what I mean? I don't think I'd been exposed to Van Halen. I mean, this is like when I was like, I don't know, seven or something, probably, you know, or something like that. So uh, that really caught my ear, but uh, I didn't ask for a guitar right away. That didn't happen until I was 12. Um, that was when I finally got my first electric guitar. Did you start on a different instrument? No. Um, no, you know, it's funny. Um, I got into music, uh, you know, pretty early on, and in particular heavy metal, too, like at a pretty early age, like third grade, um, mainly because uh, I rode the school bus, and the kids, the seventh and eighth graders on the school bus, you know, this is back in the mid-'80s, brought their boom boxes on the bus and would blast, you know, Motley Crue and Def Leppard and stuff like that, and I, I like that stuff right away, you know. But I didn't want to, like, necessarily play guitar right away when I first heard that stuff. I just liked listening to it because at the same time too, I was, I was, I, I was very into uh, nature and fishing and stuff and I actually thought I was going to be like a fishing show host, you know, when I was like 10 instead of guitar player, you know. But then once I actually got a guitar for Christmas, you know, I started, I was obsessed with it and there was nothing else I wanted to do, you know, and, and I had spent so much time in the outdoors before that as a kid and then suddenly I, here I was to shut into my, in my bedroom willingly, like every day, just playing, you know, all throughout high school as well, you know. What kind of stuff were you playing? What kind of stuff were you interested in at that age? I mean, at that age, I was, I was already into sort of all the, the guitar heroes of that time, you know. Um, when, you're, when you're that young too, you know, it's, it's like the, all the fast players really impress you and stuff. So I was into all that stuff, you know. Um, and it was kind of funny because even, even players like Jimmy Page and stuff, when, when I think about how that really wasn't that long before, you know, Zeppelin didn't break up that long before I started getting into all these hair metal bands and stuff. Yeah. But st even still, to me, Led Zeppelin already felt like my parents' music. So it, it is interesting now. It took me a while to kind of go back and look look further deeper into music and see who these players that I was influenced by, see what their influences were, and then work backwards, you know what I mean? That, uh, that didn't happen until later. So, yeah, so I was into players like Inve Malmsteen and George Lynch from Dokken and Jakey Lee from Ozzy and, yeah, all those guys. It seems like very early on you were uh, you impressed by Shredders and you're interested in Shredders. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. But there was also, you know, a lot of those players too also had a certain, set of, a certain sense of melodicism they also really liked too. And that's really what caught my ear too is that, that combination of, of kind of insane playing but also like catchiness and you know and stuff that that also stuck with me too even from a young age i mean on, on the surface i was impressed by the speed and you know but then also that wasn't I, even from a young age i knew that that's not all there is there's more there's more to good playing than speed obviously you know um but still as a youngster that that's the first thing you notice sort of you know like wow that's fast how can i do that you know uh you mentioned that you spent a lot of time by yourself practicing your guitar working on your technique mm. uh, when did you start playing with other people well, I play. I, my brother, who's uh, three or four years younger than me, he he had a drum set. Um, he got a drum set from my parents for Christmas, and we kind of started playing together. But this is both when we first got our respective instruments, and we couldn't really, we weren't really playing anything. We were just bat, we were just making noise, literally just making noise, you know. So um, I don't know if I'd really count that, you know. But that was kind of my first time like playing loud music with someone else, you know, and, and that was fun. But. Um, I was lucky enough in, in ninth grade um, 
to meet a guitar player named Christopher Ladd, who was years older than me. He was like a junior in high school or something. And he was an excellent guitar player, and we had a lot of the same musical tastes and stuff. And he lived in my neighborhood just a few blocks from me, and we, we got together one day and, and just jammed, and it was so much fun. And then he, he was like, let's start a band, and we did. And it didn't take us long to find a drummer and a bass player. So I had a band for from 91 to 93 throughout most of high school, um, kind of like a prog metal band, yeah. Very Queensryche influence kind of stuff. You know, we just made a demo. We never released it. It wasn't very good. I mean, it was okay for what it was, but uh, it, was all, it was like a great learning experience, you know. But we never played live or anything. So it sounds like even your, your earliest stuff was very, like, prog and technical. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and some of that I credit, too, to my guitar. You know, I, I started taking, my mom kind of signed me up for guitar lessons right away, too, when I was 12. And um, I was always lucky to have really good guitar teachers throughout later middle school years and high school and stuff, you know, who, they were, they were all like diverse, open-minded players and they turned me on to lots of other kinds of music too. I mean, I keep talking about metal, but the, even at the same time, I was, I was interested in so many other kinds of music and kinds of playing as well. Both Dysrhythmia and Borgats often get painted with the jazz influence brush. Mm -hmm. uh, were you actually listening to a lot of jazz at that point? I was always interested in it and, mm -hmm. you know, um, not until I went to college for music. That I, when I went to college, I actually majored in jazz guitar. And that was mostly be, not because I could actually play jazz at all. It was because I wanted to learn more about the, the form. But unfortunately, I, mean, I, finished, I finished school there, and I got my degree. But by the time I got out of there, I kind of hate, I, I hated jazz guitar in particular. Not jazz in, as, as a whole genre, but jazz guitar. I kinda, I don't know. I, I discovered that, like, yeah, there's some, there's definitely some interesting things I can take from as far as like how complex the harmony can be and the, the really rich chords and stuff. You know, you use a lot in jazz. But um, as far as actual, like, jazz playing, like, I, I couldn't. I had a hard time relating to it because in jazz a lot you don't really. And I'm not talking about jazz fusion rock stuff. I'm talking about jazz jazz. Um, you don't really tend to bend notes very much or anything. And to me, like, I, I don't know, bending and it's such an expressive way of. of playing, you know, and, and so that part of, of learning jazz guitar I couldn't relate to because I, I felt like it wasn't expressive enough for me, you know, but you know, I, I, I took from it what I, what I liked and I utilized it in my own way, you know. So if we're listening to Dysrhythmia or, or we're listening to Gorguts, um, what should we be listening to in terms of the jazz influence? You know, it, it's weird because, uh, you know, jazz in general is, is kind of thought of as an as a imp improvisational art form, you know, a lot of jazz is always like sort of the, what they call the head, you know, the main melody that usually starts off the tune and always comes back at the end or something. And then there's always this large room for improvisation and usually each member takes a solo, you know, kind of thing. That's that's typical jazz, you know. Um, and neither band, Dysrhythmia has never been like that. Um, I mean, the only sort of element of any kind of improvisation in, in Dysrhythmia music is usually just in the drums. Because Jeff, our drummer in Dysrhythmia, he's definitely the most jazz influenced and, and trained member of the band. So I think a lot of that sound, when people hear that band in particular and they think something jazzy is going on here, it's usually because of the drums, you know? And that's great, because Jeff, I, I love, he's, he's one of my absolute favorite drummers, you know? He, he has this ability to play extremely tight and proficient, but also have this sort of loose organicness about his playing, you know? And that's, um, Maybe that's what kind of gives it this weird technical but jazzy sound thing, you know. But as far as what I'm doing on guitar, it's not. I don't. I don't think of it as jazz influence at all because it's all. It's all written. It's all composed, you know. Um, it's more influenced by like dissonant modern classical music and just weird thrash bands and stuff, you know. Really, and and dissonant death metal stuff, and you know. Voivod in particular. Yeah, like Voivod, cool. huge influence. Yeah. yeah. Like growing up, was that a band that was that was really big on? Yeah. Um, it took me a while. Like the first time I heard Voivod. Uh, I knew it was interesting and different, but I didn't fully get it yet because I was a little bit too young and my ears weren't used to that kind of dissonance yet, you know? But I knew it was like, I was like, I'm going to come back to this in a few years. Maybe I'll get it. And then I did, and, and I did get it. And then it was like, once I was sucked in, I was sucked in, you know? In particular, the Nothing Face record. When, when that record came out, uh, I remember like not liking it at first, but I don't know. I kept coming back to it. And then one day I was like, wait a second, I get it now. Like... This is, and then I just was like, just engulfed me. Yeah, I find that uh, somewhat telling, just because the bands that I'm, I'm 
primarily familiar with Dysrhythmia and Gorgut mm. um, and Vora to, to a certain extent mm. are bands to me that are, you know, you don't get it immediately. Like, yeah. it, it's something that really forces you to work for it and, mm. you know, keep coming back to. Yeah. Is, is that intentional? It's not intentional. Um, it's impossible for me to really ever hear any of the music I'm involved with as if I'm hearing it for the first time. I mean, the only way I can ever have that kind of perspective is usually when another member hands me a song they've written for the band. Like in some cases, you know, like for instance, Gorguts, you know, um, like six of those songs, uh, you know, on the record there's nine songs, but one of them's the string piece. So not including that one, you have eight, eight of the heavy songs. Six of those Luke wrote pretty much on his own, you know, and, and sent to us um, to write our own parts to, but he basically wrote the song beginning to end. So in that case, you know, and also since I was already a fan of the band's previous work before I joined, I felt like when I heard those songs for the first time, or those riffs and, uh, and ideas, you know, I, I felt like I, I was like, wow, I have a, a different perspective on this than I would on like hearing a, a finished Disrhythmia song for the first time. Because with that, I'm too involved in the, the creative process and I've heard, yeah, it's different. You know, I don't have as much of a, can't tell sometimes, like, is this right? Is this done? Is this good? Whereas with, with the Gorgut stuff, I was like, oh yeah, killer. Like, I'd, I'd be like, that's awesome riff, you know, I can't wait to write something to that, you know. Um, and even, with Vora too, you know, and, and like half the material on both our albums, you know, was written primarily by the, our our singer Josh, you know, who also plays guitar. And so when he would send me a song idea, it would usually be pretty much done beginning to end. Even sometimes we program drums and extra guitar parts, and I would and his vocal ideas too. And I, and I, I could listen to it almost like I was just like hearing some new band for the first time. And yeah, in those cases, it was more easy to have like to be able to tell. If, maybe what it would be like for someone else hearing it the first time too, you know. But my ears, you know, my ears are a little bit different anyway. I'm already kind of attuned to a lot of stranger things than maybe your average listener ears would be, you know, so it's impossible to, to answer your question. And <laughs> yes, those all of so fans probably are not like the kind of stuff you get on first listen. But it's right. not it's not intentional. Okay. I mean yeah, it's not something I consciously think about, but I, but I, but something I do, I guess, some, somewhat consciously think about is, especially in the in the studio when we're recording, is it's definitely having like having some some stuff going on in the mix that isn't going to be obvious the first time, as so that it will be be more you know the album should hopefully get more interesting the more you listen to it you'll get more out of it as time goes on.
question I asked uh, another another friend of mine who's in a, a fairly odd band mm. is, how do you picture a Disney fan or a Gormets fan? Like, how would you describe that person? I mean, I can only, you know, that, that that's kind of the interesting thing about stuff like Facebook now and, and social networking, you know, because... It's really weird, and now, nowadays you can, if you want, you know, look at your Facebook page, your band page, and see like who who, are, who likes my page, and you can see like your your fans, you know, and, and it's really weird because you, you, before the internet, you didn't have that stuff. You would only know if you like went out and played shows, went on tour, and met some of these people in person, or you got letters from people in the mail or whatever. So, um, but in general, I'd say yeah, pretty, you know, usually pretty nerdy, you know, like ourselves and Luigi male and yeah, Luigi musicians. <laughs> Yeah. I will tell you this, uh, the person who got me into Gorguts was, mm. was a drummer, was a jazz drummer. Oh, yeah? And uh, he made me, I, I believe the tape he made me was Gorguts on one side uh. and uh, the Death album, Spiritual Healing on the other. Uh. And then he also made me a mixtape, which was a mix of like Suffocation and Rush and Don Caballero. Uh. And so it, it, it seems like the kind of people who would like your music are the kind of people who are definitely not... Uh, they're usually very open-minded. Yeah. And they're usually into kind of all forms of dark and heavy music, you know what I mean? Not just closed-minded metal, metal, metal guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's actually... For the most uh, part. Yeah, uh, that's actually something I'd like to get back to uh, mm. in a little while. But, um, okay, uh, so you're in school and you're, le you're learning jazz guitar. Mm. Were you playing music at that point? Were you in a band at that point? Uh, in, in college? Yeah. Um, so, uh, not really, no. I mean, I was doing, I was doing kind of non-jazz I was doing ensembles in school that were more like experimental improvisational music and not so rooted in jazz. I was doing some of that during college, but didn't really have a didn't really have a band during college. Dysrhythmia formed a second, almost like the second I graduated. I already was like had this idea to start Dysrhythmia and I already knew who I wanted to play bass with me and it was just a matter of finding a drummer which took some time. But but yeah, during that uh, to answer your question, no, I didn't really have a have a a band. I had I had like a musical one little piece of history, I guess, is, is after my high school metal band broke up, that was like uh, sometime at the end of my junior year of high school or something. So my senior year of high school, I did have a, a new um, project that, that made one demo that we actually did release, and it was, it was something called Great Division Blue, and that was just me and the original bass player of Dysrhythmia, uh, Clayton. It was just me and him, and he primarily played viola in that, uh, in that band, and... Uh, it was instrumental and it was largely acoustic based and it wasn't metal or anything, but um, it ended up, the demo kind of ended up circulating a bit in the underground through zines and stuff because we had a friend who plays in this doom metal band called Wild Up and Webs who are still around and um, he had all these sort of like underground zine connections and stuff and he liked our demo so much he would just always, every time he sent something out of his own music he would always throw our demo in the package. And I ended up making some interesting pen pals back then, like like Jason from Agaloc, the bass player. Still, we were used to write together like way back when we were like teenagers, you know, and oh, stuff. Uh, long before we joined any of these bands we're in now, yeah, you know. Yeah. And he was kind of an early supporter of, of like some of my early solo music and and, and that project, Great Division Blue, and stuff. So, yeah, we tried to continue that uh, once I entered college, but it kind of it kind of fell apart, and then we didn't start working again musically until right after we graduated and started this rhythm. Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, you said uh, you had the idea for Um uh, What was that idea? I wanted it to be instrumental. I wanted it to be a trio. I didn't want it to have a lot of soloing. I wanted it to be very composed, but also... In the beginning, Dysrhythmia was a little bit more loose, and I hate to use the word jammy, but like the way we wrote was... The way we tried to write songs in the beginning was like slightly more jammy than, than we would ever do now. You know, we would... Sometimes, some of the early Dysrhythmia stuff was written kind of like where... Uh, we would have some loose ideas or maybe like a really sh couple strong bass lines and then in rehearsal, you know, our bass player would just kind of play those bass lines, our drummer would come up with something and i kind of like try to find something cool over that and we'd just record it for like an hour and then kind of go back to these tapes later and listen through and be like, oh yeah, that, that okay, we're on to something there. Five minutes in, we finally got on to something, that's cool. And then I would try to figure out what I did and then that's kind of how we composed some of the earlier stuff. Nowadays, it's a totally different process. It's, it's an idea that's still, you know, what we are. It's instrumental, it's trio, uh, it's progressive and heavy, but maybe it's gotten more metallic and a little bit, a little bit more metal sounding as in more recent years. But in the beginning, it was definitely not to be a metal band, but to still be 
heavy and, and definitely to be energetic and aggressive and stuff. But and also at that time, you know, this is like 90, 98 is when we started dysrhythmia. At that time, there wasn't even much. It wasn't even like we were influenced by other instrumental bands because I didn't really even know of that many at that time that were doing something like this. I mean, quickly, pretty quickly after forming this rhythm, I found out about bands like Don Caballero and the fucking Champs and those bands. And I was like, oh, awesome. Like, there is like sort of somewhat of a like community of people doing this stuff. And then I found out about Breadwinner, who were kind of one of the, kind of one of the first of that whole, you know, what they were calling math rock at that time scene. But even still, a lot of those bands kind of broke up shortly after that. So in the early 2000s, those bands kind of, disappear for a while so then there was kind of like then pelican kind of happened but that's kind of a totally different style of instrumental stuff than we do you know what i mean but and nowadays now there's now it's kind of huge it's kind of booming you know all these instrumental bands but i still don't think we have much in common with a lot of those instrumental bands that are probably more popular than us these days but are newer you know what i mean what i remember about this rhythmia and this would have been around the time you guys signed a relapse mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of stuff that was going on uh, kind of like that, that noise core, coalesce, mm -hmm. danger skate plant kind of stuff, which mm -hmm. was, you know, math core to a certain extent, but mm -hmm. it was discordant, and there was a lot of, like, very tricky rhythms, yeah, and that yeah. kind of thing. Of course, Meshuggah, like, mm -hmm. started just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And so, the people that I knew that were super into dysrhythmia were, like, those kind of kids. Like, yeah. Kids who loved something heavy, but also wanted, like, a real intellect. Yeah. And, like, a real challenging uh, aspect to the music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I remember, we, we got signed the Relapse through op getting the open for Dillinger Escape Plan. Um, so, it was kind of, kind of thanks to the, well, I don't even remember really who was responsible for, for us being on that bill, but... Ultimately, thanks to Dillinger for letting us play with them. Um, you know, that's kind of how, you know, we got a chance with Relapse, and certainly it was great exposure for us. You know, and allowed us to kind of continue on after that with doing what we do. You know, so yeah. Um, I do, I do want to ask about the uh, the instrumental aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I can't think of a more clever way to uh, to phrase this than why. Like, mm -hmm. why instrumental? Um, I think. I I don't know I think because I've I, I mean I've always I think maybe because some some of, you know kind of one of my earliest impressions of music is is classical is the classical music I hear around the house, in particular kind of darker classical pieces that are popular like um, you know like the Hall of the Mountain King Suite Grieg's uh, Hall of the, you know um, Pierre Gint Suite and like Night on Bald Mountain Mazursky and stuff like that you know that even as a little kid I was like, God damn this music is dark and heavy, and and there's nobody singing and there's no lyrics it's just it's just like you can interpret this any way you want. So I don't know. That was to me that was the most intriguing thing about about starting an instrumental, a heavy and instrumental trio was like this. This can be so open to interpretation. And also, honestly, too, there was some music I felt like I was hearing back then that was awesome musically, but then I felt like the vocals were just killing it for me. So I think that was sort of an inspiration too. I was like. Ah, this band would be so cool if they didn't have this moron screaming over this. And now some of that stuff is stuff that I, I actually like now, but I think maybe at that time I was just like, ah, I don't want to hear someone just shouting over this cool music. I just want to hear the music, you know? So I think that was another sort of motivation, too.
was it a challenge to because a lot of the bands that may or may not have been your peers at the time were very much like in that like metal and hardcore scene. Mm -hmm. Was it challenging uh, as an instrumental band to uh, to get on those kind of shows? To um, the weird thing about being instrumental and the weird thing to me about relapse impression relapse's impression of us too was that. On one hand, we could kind of fit in anywhere. On the other hand, we didn't fit in anywhere. You know, it was it was kind of equally that situation. You know, where oh, so you don't have these growly vocals l limiting you to just being able to play death metal shows or hardcore shows or something. You know, but at the same time, I don't know. It was weird. Like on one hand, people perceive it as like, oh, you're instrumental. So on one hand, that should um, I don't know. There was actually people that thought that would make us more accessible, like not having vocals, because then there's no like, because yeah, vocals can turn a listener on or off so quickly, you know, it's like, on one hand you have the growling vocals that people hate, on the other hand you have screaming high-pitched vocals that some people love and lots of people hate too, so we didn't have any of that, so, um, but of course, no, I think ultimately being instrumental really limits your audience, because ultimately people do want, in general, your average listener does want to hear some catchy vocal melody and, and hear some lyrics that they can understand and relate to and stuff, you know, so... Um, yeah, I mean, so it was kind of hard to, I don't know, we didn't really know, we still don't really know where we fit in, you know, but we've been definitely given some awesome, you know, opportunities, like gone on tour with some pretty great bands that we've gone over well with, and with their crowds, and definitely have gained some new listeners. I mean, one of my favorite tours was the tour we did in 2010 um, with Cynic, that was, that was a great opportunity, and I had grown up loving uh, Focus and stuff, you know, ever since it came out, so... That was great. That was great for Disrhythmia. That was one of my favorite Disrhythmia tours ever, you know? Yeah, speaking of uh, bands whose vocals turn off people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I always liked them, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I always I always liked the robot. I mean, to me, it just sounded, like, so weird and different, you know? But, yeah, I would try to get friends into that, and they'd, the second they heard that, they'd be like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but I've always been a fan of strange vocals, yeah. you know? I, there's a lot of bands I love that I play for people, and they're just like, I can't stand these vocals, you know? I don't know, it's just my taste. But. Yeah. How did you get involved with Gorguts? Because during this entire period, or most of the period that uh, uh, Dysrhythmia was getting bigger, uh, mm. Gorguts actually went on hiatus. Yeah. The last album they put out was around 2002, From Us of the Hate. Yeah, I think it came out in 2001. Yeah, and I guess the, I, I think Luke kind of, I think, the, I think maybe the last time the band played live was 2003 maybe or something. And then I think 2005, I think Luke officially kind of actually quit playing guitar for couple of years you know he was he was really done with the band did he get in contact with you he... yeah yeah long story short i mean basically what happened was you know after from what he's told me you know after um kind of taking a break from core guts he also took a break from playing guitar completely he got really into uh woodworking and stuff and and that actually ended up becoming sort of his his job uh, like building making signs and furniture for people and and stuff like that um, and then, but then I guess around 2000, maybe around 2007 or something, uh, Steve Hurdle, you know, had played on the Obscura record, was starting a new band and asked Luke to be a part of it, but it was going to be the kind of band where Luke was more, and Luke wanted to kind of just be more of like a, a sidekick rather than a main songwriter and, and, uh, you know, composer for the band or whatever. So he did that for a couple of years and they put out that one really awesome, uh, three song EP. But then that, then that, yeah, then he quit that band. I don't really know the timeline of when all this happened, but I guess basically like he was doing Negativa, but then it was actually Steve Hurdle who suggested to Luke that, hey, you know, you should maybe you should do Gorguts again if you want to have a project where you're the main composer again, you know what I mean? And he was like, oh yeah, good, that's a good idea, you know. And I think at first Steve Hurdle actually did want to be part of that in Gorguts, you know, but I guess Luke, you know, wanted to have. Uh, wanted to work with some new people, so I guess Steve was cool with that, and he ended up showing Dysrhythmia to Luke, actually, I think going on YouTube and showing him some live videos of us, and uh, so that's, yeah, it's kind of thanks to Steve Hurdle and YouTube that I was able to join Gorguts, and yeah, Luke sent me a MySpace message back when MySpace was the thing people did, yeah, so it was kind of, I, mean, I honestly thought it was kind of a joke at first when I got the message, so I was like, is this really him, you know, because I had never met him before or anything, you know, and um yeah, it was him, and so, yeah, pretty quickly, you know, and he had asked Colin at the same time, you know, and, um, yeah, we both said yes right away, and before we knew it, he was sending us MP3s of new 
new song ideas, you know, and it was pretty, the writing process was actually really smooth, you know, really, felt really natural, like writing, writing guitar parts to Luke's songs was just like, I don't know, it came, it came naturally to me. If I'm not mistaken, I saw the Reunited Gorguts mm. in 2010, maybe? That was when we first started doing live shows. We, right. we, we, were asked, we were asked to join the band in 2008. Okay. And I think, I'm trying to remember, I think, I think Luke and John Longstreth played for the first time in two, maybe at the end of 2008 or something. And I guess in 2009 was the first time. Yeah, that was the first time I guess we got, all got together. And it's really interesting. I remember the first time we all got together in the same room because um, we had already at that time composed like at least we had finished like three songs at least and but we had never played them all together as a all together in the same room we just had been we wrote our parts and we practiced them a lot on our own so i'll never forget just sort of like john counting off one two three four and we go into like you know one of the, one of those songs and i was like wow like we all look at each other like wow cool we're <laughs> playing this shit for the first time and it, and it sounds really good you know what i mean like well, was there a lot of emailing parts back and forth? Yeah. Overdubbing it. Yeah, because everybody, you know, we all have our own little garage band or Logic or whatever, digital programs, you know, and it's really, it's so easy now, you know, just to import an MP3 and then track your guitar over it, you know, send it over Dropbox. And it's just like, it's so easy now. It's so great how fast, you know, and even now with Skype and stuff, you can almost have like, you can have a virtual band practice, you know what I mean? Just get everybody on Skype and... I mean, it's not the same as playing loud in a room together. It's right. certainly not as good, but you could still, you know, make the most of your time despite having the long distance barrier, you know, thing. That does seem to be somewhat of an issue because Luke is based uh, in Canada. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where John is based, but I know Origin, uh, a lot of those guys are from Kansas. Hmm. And you're, you're based uh, uh, here in New York. Yeah. Does, does that make uh, rehearsing uh, difficult? Is it. Uh, uh, no, it's not too bad, really. Um, I mean, now John is uh, John's left the band. Now uh, we have we have Patrice yeah. Hamlin now, who is he was in uh, Martyr and he plays with Cephalic Carnage live nowadays and stuff. But anyway, he's he's from Quebec and he only lives like an hour away from Luke. Okay. Um, but yeah, while we were composing Colored Sands and practicing for that and stuff, um, John lived in all, uh, Syracuse near Syracuse, a little bit upstate. So he wasn't too far from where me and Colin were in, in Queens. But I think, you know, Luke was so excited about the music, you know, we were making and, and just like hanging out with us. And he also loves to come down to New York that, yeah, every couple of months we would have a practice. And that was kind of enough because everybody's, everyone cares enough and, and kind of does, I hate to use word of homework, but it's kind of like doing your homework. You know what I mean? You, you practice your parts in your own time so that when you, three months later when you get together, you're not wasting anybody's time. Especially Luke has to drive, you know, 10 hours to come down here. So, yeah, it's kind of fine, you know. We can, we, can, we can totally be ready for a tour with just really one or two practices before the tour starts or something, you know. It's, yeah, it hasn't, I mean, ideally it would be better if we all lived in the same city, obviously, but it's, it's, not, it's not that bad. I think it would be harder if we were in other countries, if, we, if those guys were in Europe or something, that would be a lot harder. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not for nothing, but you were also talking about a, an elite level of musician where... You know, previously John Longstreth, you know, Origins, like, mm. those last two Origins albums are, like, two of the best death albums that have come out in the last ten years. Uh, now, it, you said the New York drummers for Martyr, mm. probably one of the great uh, technical death metal bands. Yeah, a uh, big fan of that band. Um, yeah. You know, two guys from Dysrhythmia, and you guys, you mm. know, your, your chops are, are off the wall, and fucking Nick LeMay, who, you know, really changed the morph to death metal and the way uh, pe uh, people uh, think about death metal. Um, uh, were you listening to Obscura uh, when it came out? Yeah, yeah, I was. It's funny because before that, I I was you know familiar with Gore Guts, but I wasn't a super huge fan at that time until Obscura came out. Again, another another example of my weird taste. You know, I remember Obscura came out, and all all the Gore Guts fans, for the most part, didn't react well to that record. I guess apparently, I. Um, but for me, I guess the the older Gore Guts stuff was maybe a little bit too traditional. So when that album came out, I was like, well, okay, this is. Yeah. This is something new, completely, you know. So uh, I was a huge, yeah, I was a huge fan of that record from the from the get go. Yeah. I'll, I'll get back to obscure in a little while, but mm. uh, I have read that uh, uh, Luke, if I'm not mistaken, uh, went to school for music for a while. Uh, either. Yeah. Um, later, I guess uh, maybe around the time of from Wisdom in the Hate, maybe or yeah. something. I think. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe right after that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's also cited. Uh, 
like I remember seeing like a playlist of his, and a lot of it was just classical music, like mm. you know, like uh, some modern classical music. Like when you guys met, and when you guys like finally uh, got in touch, like mm. did did you see like the similarities with each other? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, even still, every time we get together, we're always sharing. When I say new music, usually it's actually old music, you know. But sharing new, new, new things that we're into musically and stuff, you know. Especially him and Colin. Him and Colin are really like the big like classical music nerds, you know. The two of them together, you know. Like, have you heard this? Have you heard this? Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it's like you know, it, it, ultimately, you know, we play death metal, but still, if you're if you're taking influ your influence from just a bunch of other death metal, it's not going to be that interesting, you know, really, yeah. or at least unique. So that's why we. I always had open ears to <clears throat> other stuff too. You know? Yeah, uh, I mean, early. There's nothing wrong with early Gorbats, but you can very much hear. Oh, I like it death. now. I actually yeah. like it more now because I'm also even same thing with the with the early Death Records. Even I was think I was just maybe a bit more of a prog nerd back, yeah. even more so back yeah. when I was younger. So bands like yeah, Death and Gorbats and stuff. The earlier stuff, I always thought, I didn't think it was bad. I still liked it, but I just didn't listen to it as much as yeah. the later, more progressive stuff. But nowadays, like even with Death, I'm actually been listening to Leprosy a lot more than the other albums nowadays. So, you know, so like people's tastes, you know, you kind of go in circles yeah. as you get older. Come back to a lot of stuff that you didn't get when you were younger.
I'm getting real comfortable with death on an epic scale. <laughs>